Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we shall be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed. To turn and to turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning we come round right. Well, Good morning, friends. Carl Magruder here in sunny Southern California, but there's a nip in the air, so I had to wear my woolly overalls today. <laughs> I did my chaplaincy training, I call it uh, Compassion Boot Camp, at Summit Hospital up in Oakland. When I went to the room of an African American patient in the hospital, no matter their age, often the response of this sick, or injured person to my impertinent inquiry, how are you, was, I'm blessed. Several of the staff chaplains there are black, and the Reverend Stevie Stennis would walk into a patient room with, tell me, what's good? Neuroscience confirms that colloquial habits of positivity and gratitude, like those among African Americans, can actually help people to feel better and even speed their healing. Reinforcing positive neural pathways in the brain helps us to turn and to turn, to transform our minds, our thought patterns, even to help us recover from trauma. So take a moment to answer the question for yourself, what's good? In what ways do you feel blessed this morning? Well, for me, it's such a blessing to be here. And it's been a blessing, a hard blessing, to be prepared by spirit to bring these Bible half hours to FGC in this year of scales falling from our eyes. You know the Greek word apokalupsis? It comes to us as apocalypse. And in common usage, it means disaster, even teotwaki, which is an acronym for the end of the world as we know it. Armageddon, cities on fire. Oh wait, that actually happened recently. Anyway, the original Greek word simply means to uncover, poetically to lift the veil. This is a year of apocalypses. We see clearly that racism and racial disparities in our world endure and in some places are getting worse. We know that the plight of women and children throughout the world needs some serious attention. With regard to leadership, we see clearly that the emperor has no clothes and it ain't pretty. With regard to our house of cards economy, initially built on the greatest land theft in history and the labor of African slaves, we are indicted by the prophet Greta Thunberg, who in the style of Joan of Arc, reproached the principalities and powers at the UN Climate Action Summit, crying in that wilderness, how dare you? People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We're at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is the money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you, she asked. We spend half our national budget on the military which is almost entirely useless in the face of the crises we actually face, economic collapse, racism, pandemic, and climate disruption. And we, friends, are enmeshed in these systems. May God have mercy for us all. Well, since we touched on apocalypse and we're all still here, uh, what about repentance? All right, by a showing of hands, who cringes at the biblical command to repent? Well, <laughs> it seems I'm in good company. 
let's see if our mystical hermeneutic of the spirit of trickster Jesus can help us to spring that trap without getting caught by it. You know that some deer hunters don't like coyotes. They think that Canis Latrans, the singing dog, eats all the deer. Well, coyote predation keeps deer herds strong, but it's roads and loss of wildlife habitat and car collisions that kill deer. Sometimes these hunters will put a rabbit or other carcass out laced with strychnine, a poison. But the coyote's track comes up to the carcass and then away, because you can't trick trickster. Sometimes they set out deadly spring-loaded traps. Somehow coyote is able to spring the trap without getting caught or even injured. Some believe that it is mama coyotes who do this to protect their young. Once it's sprung, she squats and leaves a note for her would-be assassin. So let's spring some traps today and render them harmless to us and those we care for and about. Now tradition holds that the start of the ministry of Jesus the Nazarene was not his baptism in the River Jordan by his rabbi and cousin John, nor when the Spirit descended on him like a dove, nor yet his 40 days and nights fasting in the wilderness and his temptation by Satan. It was after he'd heard that John the baptizer had been arrested, and then Jesus took up John's cry, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew chapter four, verse 17. Now, I am calling on the trickster spirit of Br'er Rabbit to help me through the briar patch of our old wounds and good instinct against religion that shames, so that no Quakers are harmed during the making of this Bible half hour. Now, I'm serious about that. The Greek word that is translated as repent in the text is metanoia, which has the sense of transform your knowing, expand your consciousness, turn in a new direction. It more literally means to perceive afterwards. When consciousness expands, we can see what was hidden before. We say hindsight is 2020. In the midst of his beautiful treatise on the nature of love, in Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul describes, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Now, <clears throat> 300 years after his crucifixion, trickster Jesus and those who followed his way were still being hunted and persecuted on all sides. So they took his story and his teachings and his mystical connection with the oneness, and he hid it. He hid it in the most unlikely place you could think of, in the middle of the Roman Empire with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. Like a foxtail caught in a, well, fox's tail, the seed of truth was carried far and wide. He tucked it into the Nicene Creed even, where it peeks out in the subversive placement of God and Jesus above the emperor. Now, as there is with most, most trickster tricks, there was a high price to pay for this subterfuge. But there have always been those who found the true seed in whatever imperfect vessel conveyed it. And they picked it out of its accretions and nurtured the seed and grew it and harvested it and passed it on as St. Francis did. St. Francis was a mystic. He experienced the oneness of the cosmos directly. One cost that comes with the creedal codification of the way is the oversimplified notion of repentance as a one-shot deal that is mostly concerned with your transgressions of the rules and that when you have effected repentance by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are saved from your sin once and for all. I probably ought to hit that sin thing real quick while we're here. I'm checking the time. <laughs> uh, the Hebrew word chata from archery means to miss the mark or stray off the path. We translate that word as sin. Well, when you miss your mark in archery, you go get your arrow and you try again. Maybe Br'er Rabbit 
tricked you and got away this time. When you wander off the path, you find it again, eventually. Or maybe the good shepherd goes and finds you and brings you back. That's happened to me. When you become ritually unclean, you bathe in the mikvah, the sacred bath. Chata, sin, is not an indelible mark. And that fiery pit of hell thing, the Hebrews picked that up from a Zoroastrian metaphor while they were slaves in Babylon, that's Persia. Prior to Babylon, the indigenous Hebrew land of the dead is Sheol, and everyone went there regardless. That confusion has caused a lot of unnecessary suffering. Hell and damnation. Well, <laughs> we are called to prayer without ceasing, and I believe that we are also called to repent without ceasing. Individually and as a body, we are called to repent without ceasing. Repentance is an iterative process. It's my experience that there may be a big thunderbolt moment after which we are changed, our consciousness is transformed, and metanoia to perceive after opens our eyes, including our third eye, in an indelible way to what was hidden, and we are changed forever. For mystics, that moment stems from the direct and personal encounter with the divine. Let those with eyes to see, see. Like George Fox in his Apocalypse on Pendle Hill, we repent and turn towards God. But then the more we see and live, the more we see and live, until to turn and to turn becomes our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. This is what it means to be simple in the hymn of our religious cousins, the Shakers, simple gifts. It's not about decluttering or wearing a collarless shirt. Anyway, it's about a life entirely oriented around Godness. Thomas Kelly starts his book of Revelation called A Testament of Devotion with this assertion. Deep within us all, there is an amazing inner sanctuary of the soul, a holy place, a divine center, a speaking voice to which we may continuously return. Eternity is at our hearts, pressing upon our time-torn lives, warming us with intimations of an astounding destiny, calling us home unto itself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All I really need to know, I learned from reading Thomas Kelly. If you once thought that your sexual orientation or another's was a sickness or an affront to God, and you have come to understand that all love is a divine gift, you have repented. If you once thought that one religion was the only way to know God and have come to a more universalist understanding, you have repented. If you have ever admitted to yourself, to God, and to another person that you are powerless over your addiction, by God, you have repented. For some of us African-American folks, declaring black is beautiful was a repentance, a new way of perceiving ourselves as perfect in the sight of God. Three quick repentance examples. Number one, sometime after the crucifixion of Christ, there was a Jew, Saul, who was a Greek citizen and a rabid persecutor of the early Christian movement. He was at the killing of the apostle Stephen, yes, he was one of the night riders in his white robe with conical hood. That's conical, not comical, though that would also apply. They burned a cross on Stephen's front lawn and then dragged him out in his pajamas to the edge of town, breathing threats and murder. When Stephen was lynched while Saul held the horses. Sometime later on the road to Damascus, trickster Jesus smote Saul down and took his sight, demanding, why do you persecute me? Saul fasted and was blind for three days and received help from one who feared him, Ananias, who laid loving hands on Saul and something like scales fell from his eyes and he repented to become Jesus' number one fan, the Apostle Paul. Example two. Only 368 years ago, an eccentric looking man with a big nose and shaggy, shaggy locks, sporting leather pants, parked his Harley chopper in front of an English country church and went in. 
In those days, just as in the synagogues of Jesus' time, it was possible for a visitor to preach to the assembly, as long as they didn't blaspheme, of course. This character, bearing the wily trickster name of Fox, inquired, You will say Christ saith this, and the apostles say this, but what canst thou say? Art thou a child of light, and hast thou walked in the light? And what thou speakest, is it inwardly from God? He was asking if people had repented, turned and surrendered to the inward Christ. A woman of some social standing heard this call and later wrote, This opened me so that it cut me to the heart, and then I saw clearly we were all wrong. So I sat down in my pew again and cried bitterly, and I cried in my to the Lord, we are all thieves. We have taken the scripture in words and know nothing of them in ourselves. Margaret felt in turn to walk in the light of this apocalypse, this uncovering. She later was widowed and married that itinerant biker, George Fox. Example three. More recently, currently, all over Quakerdom and elsewhere, friends of European descent are doing white privilege work, seeing their unearned advantage at the expense of others, examining their unconscious bias, confessing ways they have been complicit in and benefited from the racial status quo. Some present in this Zoom room are living into a new understanding of what race means to them. This is a courageous and liberating kind of repentance, and it is already bearing some fruits of the spirit. But our racial justice work is hardly complete. Our piecemeal, awkward, politically correct, sometimes legalistic approaches to healing racism are merely the scaffolding we need to raise the Holy Ghost building of perfect love. Now we see in the glass darkly, but someday we will live effortlessly and joyously in harmony as God intended, as Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned. Just as the laws of Moses, an eye for an eye, didn't actually get the Israelites to shalom, the peace of God, these laws were a big improvement over, if you put out my eye, I'm going to kill your whole family, which is what had come before. Let us repent. Let us change. Let us repent without ceasing. Our iterative racial repentance must continue so that the goal of the FGC Institutional Assessment on Racism is to render itself obsolete. For now, we need these efforts to help us to straighten up on our way to becoming perfect, even as my Heavenly Father is perfect. Well, perfection's on Thursday. We can be confident that we will grow closer to the divine will if we have courage to stay the course. We can look back and see the distance we have come in some things, we friends. The nominating slate in my monthly meeting actually has more women than men in all areas of officers and committees, for instance. And we have come a long way in my yearly meeting since my early teen years when we were discerning about same-sex marriage and I recall one sincere and loving friend asking with real care and concern, if homosexuality is an illness, should we be encouraging people to be unwell? I believe that friends have come a long way on LGB, lesbian, gay, and bisexual identities in four decades, but some of us really need to, say it with me now, repent and transform our minds with regard to T, trans and gender non-conforming folks. Now, tricksters change their gender all the time. Loki becomes pregnant in female form and gives birth. Of course, it's a pretty big metanoia to throw out what we thought we knew about a binary, born with it, anatomically determined notion of gender. But let's all get with the pronouns because these friends are courageous pioneers discovering new territories which have salvific potential to liberate us all from the gender binary. Oh, freedom. Also, and in all seriousness, trans people, and especially trans people of color, suffer more hate crime than any other group. The wages of my sin of not seeing trans as an expression of the divine is their death. And so I gladly repent. 
the wages of my sin is their death. And so I repent. Repentance is a two-parter. First, one must turn away from the old ways and then engage the new. To turn and to turn will be our delight. Jesus knew wine will burst old wineskins. New wineskins are needed. Early friends knew that the truth that had discovered them would not fit into conventional and comfortable religious forms of an elite priesthood, ornate steeple houses, performative rites, an absentee God, creeds, tithes, etc. Not knowing what they should do, they apophatically discarded everything that was superfluous to the indwelling experience of God. They threw it all out and turn themselves towards God for instruction. I gotta say though, I think getting rid of the music was a bridge too far. It's the rest of the statement in Matthew that gives us a clue. First repent, but then for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is among you, or is near, or is arriving, or has drawn near. You get the picture. You can look at various translations. The Greek word is engizo, which most literally means has drawn close, according to Strong's concordance. Schlosser's notation adds that engizo expresses extreme closeness, immediate eminence, even a presence. It is here because the moment of this coming happened repent for the perfection of God is here. We've heard it interpreted as a warning all our lives. Get your act together for God is coming and if you don't you are going to get a smite down. It's the threat that follows up the shaming and condemnation we've been taught to hear in repent. But that's not how mystics perceive ultimate reality. It's not how God mind is. Jesus tried to wrap it down to the Pharisees in Luke 17 20 to 22. The Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God was coming. God's kingdom, replied Jesus, isn't the sort of thing you can watch for and see coming. People won't say, look, here it is, or look over there. No, God's kingdom is within your grasp. Thomas Kelly tells us that the hound of heaven is ever baying at our heels. Now, we will get into this some more tomorrow, but George Fox had a radical hermeneutic. He writes, I saw they could not know the spiritual meaning of Moses, the prophets, and John's words, unless they had the spirit and the light of Jesus, nor could they know the words of Christ and the apostles without his spirit to guide them. His is the hermeneutic of spirit, which interprets the text. It's a direct contradiction to Martin Luther's sola scriptura, scripture alone, which was nonetheless liberative in its time because it suggested that people could come to God by reading the Bible without the church, which Luther saw as corrupt. Fox seems to be implying that the biblical writers were in the grip of the Holy Spirit while they were writing. Now, I don't want to make a case for every writer in the Bible. There's at least 40 of them. Um, I'm not sure they were all in the spirit of God when they sat down to write. Have you read Leviticus? There are a lot of consolidating power agendas in the text and several cases of severe untreated obsessive compulsive disorder in there. I'm really earning my blasphemer B, my blasphemer B branding this morning, <laughs> like James Naylor. <laughs> but the mystical hermeneutic of trickster Jesus absolutely assumes that Jesus, who never wrote anything that we have, was absolutely in an exquisite perfection of God mind. I don't have evidence for that proof. I just posited it when I started seminary because otherwise, why read about him? Since then, I have found mounting evidence throughout the text and everywhere. So I've told you my mystical hermeneutic lens. I'm offering these Bible half hours so we can explore it a bit together. Now, lots of deep scholarly and even quite progressive uh, uh, folks, biblical scholars, Howard Wass and Bart and Cohn and Stringfellow, C.S. Lewis, some contemporary Quakers hold with the idea that the man Jesus thought that the world was going to end real soon. 
In Matthew 16, 28, Jesus tells the disciples, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the man, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. His were chaotic times. The mid-17th century was pretty apocalyptic for early friends with economic upheaval, various religious movements. Politically, it's the king, it's Cromwell, it's the king again. Even a mini ice age. We too are in a difficult time. If you don't think that we're teetering on the brink of a great turning now, well, it's time to let the scales fall from your eyes. It is the end of the world as we know it, just as it was for Christ and for early friends. You cannot step in the same river twice because it's always changing. The world is always ending and beginning anew. Behold, virtual FGC. But if Jesus was a deep mystic, not just dipping into that mystical awareness from time to time the way that I do, but living full within it at all times, he knew that the realm of heaven is always in all times and places, amongst all people and in all religions, all wisdom traditions, always right here if we turn towards it. This belief is our spiritual inheritance from our Christian roots, our pearl of great price, friends. Turn to it, where the peace of divine love is right here. Now, I will pray us into some closing worship with a musical prayer by Karen Anderson. <clears throat> Hold my voice in the light. Uh, we will, we start an, a half hour early in worship and we will stay for 15 minutes after the hour. And you're welcome to stay with us. If you have ministry from the spirit for these gathered today, please unmute yourself and share it. If you need to leave at the hour, go in grace. Some of us will worship until a quarter pass, and all are welcome to join. Guide my feet as I walk. Guide my feet, guide my feet. Holy, holy, as I walk, guide my hands as I work, guide my hands, guide my hands. Holy, holy, as I work and guide my heart as I pray, guide our hearts, guide our hearts. Holy, 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 as we pray, guide our feet as we walk, guide our feet, guide our feet, oh, holy, holy, as we walk.